Oh, no, he will. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's event, uh, whether you're here in, in person or joining us online. My name is Mohammed al Kafaji, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Federation of Ethnic Communities Councils of Australia, or FECA, and it is my absolute pleasure to be your MC, and uh, I'll be chairing the panel discussion tonight. To begin our proceedings, please welcome Uncle Michael West from the Metropol Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council to welcome us to country. Thank you. Thank you. I was going to say Bajadi Gamaru or Gadigalioran, there's a few familiar faces obviously here um, that I've known for a few years, many years. And um, when you think about it, we just had uh, World Pride. Did everybody go to events? Yes, yes, the concert was great um, in the domain. Not that I didn't go the last one, I was quite tired, but um, the first one was quite good with, uh, had a very um, First Nations feel to it, the whole facade and uh, up there, and then you had um, Deborah Cheatham, um, Moju, Jessica Malboy, um, and it was Kylie Minogue with her sister Danny coming on at the end. Um, it was great and they had a wonderful show of uh, drones where they had uh, the pride flag and they had a world that was rotating and they also had the um, Aboriginal flag which turned into a, from a sun to a heart in the middle. So that was quite special. It was, uh, yes. I felt there was a lot of um, love in the air and everyone respecting each other and that, which was great. And um, when you think about it, there is no, no GLBTIQA plus rights, nor is there women's rights, there's just human rights. And that's how we need to think about it. There's human rights. Obviously a little bit different for everyone um, with our diversity and we need to have a society that appreci appreciates our diversity and is inclusive no matter what postcode you were born in, no matter the colour of your skin, the shape of your eyes um, and how your gender you identify by. It's so important that we we do. And um, I went to a few of the um, GLBTIQA plus events and um, what I said was um, we're all born superstars. There's nothing wrong with loving who you are. Don't be a drag, be a queen. Don't be a drag, be a queen. <laughs> Favour you're born this way. I think that's um, some great lyrics and a great thing to, to think about and, and live by, that everyone is born different and um, we should appreciate ourselves and we should appreciate each other. And as Australians, you have a responsibility to look after our culture and our sites. It's very important because they're your culture and sites too uh, for, for humanity itself. And you know we have those 40 plus thousand year old fish traps in Brewarana. So we're lucky in New South Wales to have the oldest living known I mean, human structure in the, in the world today. Uh, and they're still operating. They may have been flooded of late. Um, and that's another reason we have to think about things because, you know, we haven't been respecting Mother Earth. And uh, Mother Earth provides us with everything when you think about it from our food to our clothes to all the um, infrastructure you see around. Everything is provided by her and we need to respect her and look after her. We've had a couple of difficult years, obviously, with the pandemic and no, we're not at the end, no matter some, what some people are saying. We've still got a couple of years to go and um, I work in health. And um, <clears throat> it's important to remember that, that um, and we need to pay respects to um, all Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander traditional owners, elders and custodians of the past, present and future. Pay respects to our ancestors. Uh, pay respects to those we've lost over the last few years. And uh, remember, they're not just numbers. They're people with names, uh, people with faces, people who had their own aspirations and dreams, and they belong to family and communities. And we need to remember that and pay respects to that. Um, and also reflect your journey here right now and at this point in the continuum. And, um, it has, as I said, it has been difficult and it's important you do take your self-care that you need to um, because it, because it is, has been very difficult and we've still got a ways to go. And we do live in somewhat of an interesting world, don't we? So if we have a moment of silence and a moment of reflection and paying respect, thank you.
there are three beautiful waterways, the Hawkesbury, Nepean, and George's, and these are the aquatic boundaries of our nation. To any of my Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander brothers and sisters in here or online, um, we warmly welcome you from country, from clan, from tribe, and from nation. And to all our brothers and sisters, we are all one mob, humanity. Um, we warmly welcome you from family, from community, from neighbourhood, and ultimately the country you come from. And um, we share a little one planet called Earth, floating forever, expanding cosmos. And we are going through quite difficult times when you think about it. Um, we've got someone in, in Europe who started a war, first great big war since um, 77 years, and um, some of the rhetoric coming out of this is quite bizarre, and it's just escalating when you think about it, saying that they're fighting Nazis and now they're fighting GLBTIQ Nazis, which is quite weird and unbelievable. And... Um, Yes, we should be thinking about the world that we live in, be good global citizens. And, uh, you know, times are difficult, but we need to um, create a better world. And sometimes it's difficult moving forward and doing that. And um, we should be honest with, with leadership that um, riding around on a horseback with no shirt on, wrestling a drug bear or um, playing ice hockey is not about being a good human or a good male. It's, uh, I guess it's going down the tracks of, um, of to toxic masculinity when you think about it, not being a good human. And it's important we call these things out. So on behalf of Metropolitan and Local Aboriginal Land Council, welcome everyone here. As I said, human rights are important. Um, everyone has human rights and we need to remember that. And we need to create a society when everyone can fulfil their dreams and aspirations. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land, never ceded. And we've got some tough conversations um, continuing about dates, about voice, about treaty. Uh, and voice is just one component. It's not the end or be all. Um, it's just one component, uh, getting, giving good advice and logical advice and, and drawing on our experience is important. And um, let's see how we can create a better world. Thank you. Thank you, Uncle, for that beautiful welcome to country and um, for sharing your wisdom uh, with us all and setting the scene for a, um, a night which I'm sure will be very exciting. Um, I too would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and I pay my respect to their elders past and present. I'd like to acknowledge that later this year we will all be heading to the polls uh, for history-making referendum and uh, I urge you all to ensure that you yourselves and others, family and friends, are well informed um, in making a, um, the right choice and being part of history. Uh, many thanks to our Auslan interpreters, uh, Bettina and Rebecca over there. Um, and if you're watching online, uh, there's also live captioning. Uh, please join us uh, in the conversation on Twitter and social media using the hashtag OzHumanRightsAct. Uh, would love to see what everybody is talking about uh, because not everybody is here in the room. For the past four years, the Australian Human Rights Commission has been working on a project called Free and Equal, an Australian conversation on human rights. Through the project, the Commission has sought to identify what makes an effective system of human rights protection for 21st century Australia and what steps Australia needs to take to get there. Following an extensive consultation process, the Commission is now releasing a position paper outlining a proposal for an Australian Human Rights Act. The Gilbert and Turbin Centre for Public Law at the University of New South Wales has been a key partner in the de development of the Free and Equal Project. And because of this association, tonight's event is being held uh, here and being supported generously by the law firm Gilbert and Turbin. And we're currently here in their offices uh, in Sydney at uh, Barangaroo. To welcome us to this venue, please welcome Michelle Hannon, Gilbert and Tobin Partner for Pro Bono Services and Corporate Responsibility. Hello everyone, thanks Mohammed, and thank you Michael for that lovely welcome. I also acknowledge that we're on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and I acknowledge we're on unceded land. Thank you all for coming along tonight. We are really happy to be able to be involved in the launch of this really important step in human rights. 
um, Gilbert and Tobin's long had an association with the Commission and with human rights work. And looking out here, we've had an association with many of you too. Um, as a partner in the pro bono practice, I see on a regular basis just how a human rights bill or act would benefit and promote and protect the rights of some of our most vulnerable people in Australia far more effectively than um, what we currently have. So we are particularly excited about this step. Welcome, and we hope that you enjoy the evening. Thanks, Michelle. As we've noted, the Free and Equal Project is, the, is an initiative of the Australian Human Rights Commission. To tell us a little bit more about the project and to officially launch the Commission's position paper for an Australian Human Rights Act, please welcome the President of the Commission, Emeritus Professor Ros Croucher AM. Thank you, Mohammed, and thank you, Michelle, and thank you to Gilbert and Tobin for hosting this event tonight. You are true partners in a wonderful project. And I add to Michael's warm welcome to country an acknowledgement on behalf of the Australian Human Rights Commission to Elders past, present and emerging and to any Indigenous guests that are joining us in person or online for this wonderful evening. I also want to affirm my clear support for the Uluru Statement from the Heart and for a successful re referendum to enshrine an Indigenous voice to Parliament. This is a moment of great importance in our history. The time is ripe for constitutional recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples to ensure Australia fully complies with the positive obligation to recognise the status of our first peoples and to fully protect their rights to effective participation in decisions relating to them. I wish to acknowledge the presence tonight of so many distinguished guests from the legal, human rights and civil society sectors, too many to single out by name in the time we have available, but I thank you, we thank you for your participation. Many have been involved in the development of the paper that we're launching tonight, and I'd, I'd like to extend the Commission's gratitude for the time, effort and expertise that you and your colleagues have contributed. In December 2018, on International Human Rights Day, I threw out a sky anchor, as I called it at the time, in announcing Free and Equal, an Australian conversation on human rights. And through this conversation over the years in, the, in, in between, we have been reimagining our system of protection of human rights and freedoms so that we can provide everyone with the opportunity to be the best that they can be. And we've sought to identify what makes an effective system of human rights protections for 21st century Australia. Developments over the past three years have shown that we need to introduce better protections of human rights at the federal level. The COVID-19 pandemic showed that politicians engaging in a dialogue about human rights contributes to greater transparency in decision-making and does not impair the ability of governments to govern efficiently. To this end, you may recall the daily press conferences of premiers in which they sought publicly to justify why restrictions on our freedom of movement and other freedoms and rights were necessary and proportionate responses to the harm from waves of COVID in the community. And on an almost daily basis at the moment, we are shocked by the evidence to the Royal Commission into robo-debt, indicating that concerns about illegality of the scheme were disregarded by ministers overseeing the scheme, with public servants lacking courage to speak up about their concerns. The need for enhanced accountability so that decision makers have a duty to consider the human rights impact of their actions could not be clearer. 
The title of our national conversation in 2019 was drawn directly from the first sentence of the first article of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. That great document represented the coming together of different intellectual, philosophical and political traditions into a set of common commitments for all humankind. This year, we celebrate the 75th anniversary of its adoption. Through 2019 to 2021, we released an issues paper, three discussion papers, including a submissions process. We held a spectacular national conference on human rights and associated technical workshops featuring the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, Dr. Michelle Bachelet. And we conducted a series of roundtables, technical workshops and stakeholder contributions. The project's final outputs include two position papers on key reform priorities and a final report to be completed this year. The first position paper was released in December 2021 to coincide with Human Rights Day. Free and Equal, a reform agenda for federal discrimination laws. In this, we set out a reform agenda to modernise our federal discrimination laws including by remedying deficiencies in the current laws, by placing a greater focus on prevention of discrimination, and by introducing co-regulatory approaches that enable governments and businesses in particular to be better equipped to prevent and or deal with discrimination. But addressing discrimination alone is not enough to ensure that people's human rights are protected. The second position paper, which we are launching tonight, is designed to deal with issues that discrimination laws are not capable of addressing. It pre presents our case as the National Human Rights Institution for the introduction of a Federal Human Rights Act in Australia and an outline of our proposed model and associated reforms. This is the central missing piece of our domestic legislative framework for the promotion and protection of human rights in Australia. It brings rights home. We will catch up with every other country in the Commonwealth of Nations by introducing comprehensive human rights protections in domestic legislation. It will also complete the intended design of the Australian Human Rights Commission itself the hole in the donut of our institutional legislative architecture. Australia is a strong democracy with a robust electoral and parliamentary system, an independent judiciary and respect for the rule of law. For this reason, many people perceive that their human rights are legally protected when in fact they are not. As it stands, our constitution protects some rights expressly or impliedly through its limitations on legislative power of the Commonwealth, not as a protection of individual rights. The principle of legality acts as a handbrake of a limited kind on encroachment of rights, and the parliamentary scrutiny of legislation plays an important role. That Indefinite administrative te detention is not unlawful under our existing laws, suggests why our current protections, including the rule of statutory construction known as the principle of legality, are just not enough. In this position paper, the Commission concludes that the existing mechanisms are insufficient and do not provide the human rights protections to which all people in Australia are entitled. The main focus of our model is that it names human rights to be protected, requires decision makers to consider their impact on human rights by placing duties on them to this effect, and provides pathways for breaches of human rights to be conciliated with the possibility, as a last resort, of judicial action if all of the above do not resolve the issue. 
The need for better human rights protections in Australia can be summarised by one simple proposition. We should have better protection of human rights at the national level because everybody's human rights matter all of the time. To do so requires that human rights are embedded within the laws of our country so that they have practical effect for individuals and are consistently and coherently applied by government. A Human Rights Act would ensure that the rights and freedoms that Australians rightly expect and assume are protected and are in fact protected. There is nothing exceptional about the idea that when making laws or taking actions or decisions under them, parliamentarians and public officials should consider the human rights impact of their actions and should favour options that positively protect human rights or cause minimal harm to them. It should be a rare circumstance when a government chooses a pathway that breaches human rights. In these circumstances, it should state that this is its intention up front, own it and explain why this is acceptable to the public. Not an easy thing to do and one for which government will be held to account. The proposed model also addresses the deficiencies of the existing human rights complaints pathway for individuals whose rights have been breached, which the Commission has been administering since 1981. This complaints pathway under the Human Rights Commission Act leads to complaints through the lens of the international human rights treaties rather than by referencing enumerated rights in domestic law. We seek to resolve these complaints through conciliation. However, unlike regular unlawful discrimination laws, there is no recourse to enforceable remedies through the courts if the matter does not resolve. This left hundreds, if not thousands of Australians with no access to remedies when they were stranded overseas and locked out of their home country during the COVID pandemic. The Commission handled a significant number of these complaints with very little responsiveness and action from government about the concerns being raised including for people seeking to be reunited with dying relatives or in need of critical medical support back home. This lack of respect to our own citizens should not be repeated. Failures to protect human rights can affect all kinds of people and any lack of respect for human rights degrades society at large. Often those most harmed by human rights breaches are the most vulnerable among us. Providing a pathway to enforceable remedies in a Human Rights Act would substantially improve access to justice and accountability for government decision making. It would be an evolution, not a revolution, in our ability to handle and respond to complaints. The model for a Human Rights Act that we are putting forward draws on comparative international models and the ACT, Victorian and Queensland models. It builds on the excellent work of the National Human Rights Consultation Committee, chaired by Father Frank Brennan, SJ, and its report of 2009, and the research and advocacy of the Human Rights Law Centre, the Law Council of Australia, and many other community partners for bringing rights home. It is a model that retains and emphasises the supremacy of our parliament, an entirely different approach to rights protections from jurisdictions such as the United States of America. The beauty of a Human Rights Act and other measures that front load rights mindedness is that they are expressed in the positive and they are embedded in decision making and ahead of any dispute. A Human Rights Act names rights. 
it provides an obligation to consider them and a process by which to do it, together supporting a cultural shift towards rights-mindedness, becoming part of the national psyche, not just an afterthought. In leading this Australian conversation on human rights, the Commission, as Australia's national human rights institution, is taking seriously and aspirationally the statutory mandate given to us by parliaments since 1981. I commend the paper to all of you and look forward to sharing the next steps in our journey towards a human rights framework reimagined for Australia in the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for um, op those opening remarks. Uh, myself, as a non-lawyer, I'm very excited for tonight's panel, um, as I'm sure I'll be learning a lot about this very important um, piece of work, which has been in the, in the pipeline for over four years. So congratulations to everybody involved. Um, while we're getting ready to um, uh, move on to our panel discussion, uh, we'll be playing a video uh, prepared by the Human Rights Law Centre as part of their uh, Charter of Rights campaign. It focuses on Victoria's Human Rights Charter um, and how that helped protect the rights of Bendigo's Muslim community. For people here or online with vision impairment, the person speaking in the video is Dr. Aisha Nilam, the, speaks, uh, the spokesperson for the Bendigo Islamic Community Centre. The Benigo Islamic Community Centre and the case surrounding it is a great example of how the Charter of Human Rights has been upheld and allowed a small community in Bendigo to practice their faith as citizens of Australia without any discrimination. We're building this in three stages and the next stage is laying down the actual site for the mosque which has begun, which is really, really exciting for us. We're just trying to find a space where we can all hang out. Essentially, that was the idea behind it. So in about 2015, um, a series of unfortunate events unfolded in Bendigo. Uh, there were people who were shouting, you know, racial slurs. Um, th there was a lot of hate being spewed at these riots. It was a very angry mob. And that's what it was. It was a mob. My understanding is that they were protesting, you know, the building of a mosque. But what it signified was more than that. It was, it was intolerance. And what started off as something really small turned into something really, really ugly. And then some people um, allied with them and they decided to pursue this through a legal channel, um, which resulted in a very long and painful court case which lasted several years. Um, but in essence, it was a fight for human rights. It went to the highest court of appeal and um, the opposition lost, which we're very grateful to our lawyers. And, you know, I'm truly happy that we live in a country like Australia and a state like Victoria where you know, human rights can be upheld and the Charter of Human Rights is upheld. While a lot of us see the ugliness surrounding this case and the rioting and the, the infamy that it brought to Bendigo, what we saw as a result of this and the silver lining in all of this was how the Bendigo town, the town of Bendigo banded together and united as one voice to say that we will not tolerate this. And what it showed us as the Muslim community as well was that there's a lot that unites us and a lot less that divides us. And we do stand together and together we're stronger.
Welcome back, everyone. Uh, right now, we'll um, introduce uh, all the panelists and we'll unpack what it means uh, to have a national um, Australian Human Rights uh, Charter. Um, maybe we'll start from, uh, from my left. Um, Ros, did you want to introduce yourself and tell us why you're involved in, in this project in, in general and why, for the rest of the panelists, why you're involved in this panel? Uh, well, as president of the Australian Human Rights Commission and a commission which is connected to the, the world through our um, international treaties, um, the, the conversation internationally and domestically is where is Australia in terms of protecting human rights at, in this way in domestic legislation. So the whole idea of bringing rights home was part of that aspirational sky anchor that I flew out, threw out at the end of 2018 to try and create some gravitational pull towards what is the kind of protection we need in Australia. So it's been my uh, driving mission while I have this um, very privileged mandate to be able to contribute to the great work that so many others have done to stand on the shoulders of giants and add the voice of the National Human Rights Institution to that. Congratulations. Peter, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us why you're involved? Um, my name's Peter Russo. I'm the state member in the Queensland Parliament or the electorate of TUI and I'm uh, the chair of the Legal Affairs and Community Committee um, of, uh, of that parliament. Um, my involvement um, in relation to the Queensland legislation was there was basically a group effort. It wasn't just me. Um, um, Amy McVie and Scott McDougall and, and now uh, former Deputy Premier uh, Jackie Trad, our current Attorney General uh, Shannon Fenderman and uh, Leanne Enoch um, were all uh, part of the drive. Um, to have the legislation passed and I guess at the time that we did pass it I naively thought that other states would follow suit um, um, but that's proven not to be the case but however our, we do have a Human Rights Act in Queensland. Congratulations. Well done. Caitlin, over to you. Thanks Mohammed, and it's great to be here. I'm the uh, CEO of the Human Rights Law Centre. Uh, you saw the video uh, already and I'm really excited to be part of this conversation because the Human Rights Law Centre since 2018 has been uh, leading a campaign for, for a National Charter of Human Rights. Uh, we were set up uh, just as the Victorian Charter was, was coming to life. And we've, we've seen the value of that and we now have more than 80 organisations who have signed on to the campaign uh, supporting, uh, supporting the need for this kind of foundational law. And, you know, that includes children's rights organisations, First Nations rights groups, disability rights groups, and really see all of our research uh, shows that there's really broad public support for this. So really, really happy to be here. And personally, as a human rights lawyer, having worked on these issues for, for more than 20 years, I think it's, it's an exciting time in history. Fantastic. Well done. And Terry? Uh, Terry Carney, uh, Emeritus Professor at uh, Sydney Law School. Why am I here? Copping and tailing, I suppose. Um, I'm so ancient that in 1984, after chairing a two-year inquiry into child welfare legislation and practice reform in Victoria. Um, we recommended new legislation that the government uh, adopted, minus the proposed dialogue model charter of uh, rights for children, young people and families. Most recently, because um, uh, of my involvement in trying to stop the robo-debt um, obnoxious illeg illegality as a member of the AAT, um, I've been turning my mind to um, whether 
a human rights act would have made uh, any difference uh, to that outcome. And between those two uh, bookends, I suppose, I've written um, about uh, academically, uh, about um, the human right to social security, uh, about aged rights, and that's probably the spot to finish when you look as old as I do. <laughs> <laughs> We've got specific questions on those, so we'll come to you uh, for your expertise there. All right, let's start with the need for a Human Rights um, Act. So, Caitlin, let's start with you. Um, why is the status quo not enough, and what is the value that would be added by having a Human Rights Act at a national level? This is really about bringing the, the shared values that, that we already know Australians um, hold dear to fairness and respect and dignity and justice and making that really clear uh, in, a, in a piece of legislation that guides all public decision making. And so it's about putting those values into the, hearts, into the heart of how decisions are made, how laws are debated and weighed up in all of the, um, the complexity of public policy making and then giving people uh, direct uh, access to take action when they need to. And, you know, really despite all of the um, advantages that a, that a society like Australia enjoys, the wealth, the democratic traditions, we still know that time and time again people fall through the gaps. And you know, First Nations communities have been saying this and experiencing this for more than 200 years. Uh, we've got many other examples of royal commissions pointing out that, uh, that people in aged care are, are not being treated with dignity or their, their basic rights to, to health are, are not being respected. So the status quo is not enough. And the, uh, the, the challenge we have here is that we've had to resort to essentially legal acrobatics to, uh, to find ways of protecting human rights and it shouldn't have to be that hard. Thank you. Peter, I'll ask you the same question. Why is the status quo not enough and how will an act like this um, add value? Well, just um, relying on the Queensland experience, um, when you look at the reports that have come out of the Human Rights Commission in Queensland, you will see the interaction between um, people and the departments and the fact that they are, are now able to have um, their uh, rights uh, looked at and, and the complaints range from, um, from uh, health all the way through to corrective services, um, Queensland Police and so um, there is an active process whereby people can come and have their um, their grievances aired. Um, our act is, a, I believe, a little bit different to the Victorian Act in that it allows um, a dispute resolution format. Um, it doesn't obviously go far enough and some of the submitters to the report said that we should have uh, allowed um, people to be able to go to the courts, um, but um, we, we landed um, on the dispute resolution um, model um, and I guess you know there are some advantages in staying out of the courts um, if you can get a resolution um, you know costs and also the stress of, of a court case yeah, that, that's why well just relying on the Queensland experience um, I, I believe it it works and to have a, a, a federal act um, would also uh, work but it would cover a broader range of uh, rights and, and, and Australian citizens. Beautiful. Terry? Um, for reasons that have been canvassed in part by uh, Rod, um, that the common law legality principle is too narrow, too inadequate, um, so the existing machinery is insufficient, uh, number one. Number two, because it um, provides, in addition to substantive remedies, um, about which I've got some views about how positive and what the limitations are. Um, it also um, serves a very important symbolic. Uh, it elevates the voice of human rights um, in the community, civil society uh, and democratic uh, dialogue and that is uh, very important. But um, it's not the only piece 
missing from the machinery to protect human rights, because in the area that most uh, interests me, the ordinary citizen with mass uh, issues, like half a million robo-debt clients, mm. I'm afraid it, we need other machinery uh, to convert the symbolism of a Human Rights Act um, into the kind of substantive protection that people want Beautiful. and deserve. Peter, you championed uh, the need for a Human Rights um, Act in Queensland. In its short history so far, what do you think uh, you've been, uh, the Act has been able to achieve? Um, I, I guess repeating myself, I think um, the access to, uh, that people have when they feel that they're not, um, you know, um, being um, listened to or, or their rights are being trampled on by a particular department, um, I think that's the most glaring thing to me. Um, I think it's uh, too high um, an accolade to say that I uh, championed it. As I said earlier, there were many other forces afoot um, to help it. I just happen to be a small part of it, but yeah, happy to be a small part. I think one of the, the, the things that even as we grapple with um, what is happening in Queensland from time to time, you know, like our work on the committee is, is guided by, by the legislation. Um, which I think is another aspect, and I'm sorry, Mohammed, I might be um, getting ahead of myself on one of the other questions, but um, I, look, I just think that um, it really helps um, politicians focus their mind on when there is you know, legislation to be introduced, and it, it is a bit of a... Um, it is a bit of a, a mess it, 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 in some aspects of it, and it's not as clear cut as probably we would all like it to be. But the point is, we are able to have the discussion mm. and the debate, and I think that's the difference that not having it um, has. Yeah. Do you think? Um it's difficult uh, for your colleagues to discuss these issues because it's a new act and they're trying to kind of get used to it or is it um, truly difficult to apply? It's, it, it's not difficult to apply on, on a, on a um, bill legislation um, because we, we've got, I think, seven committees. So each committee deals with their different um, portfolios. Um, but uh, I think the thing about it is perhaps it's we're also on a learning curve. And, um, you know, um, when I got invited to this, I went back to read our report. And, um, you know, there's a lot of things that are happening that will happen with the Act into the future. For example, one of the things, um, the, the Act is to be reviewed um, it, um, we gave um, the department some wriggle room here. Um, on reflection, I should have been a little bit more strict in my timelines. But it says um, that the Act is to be reviewed sometime after July 23, which um, is, not, <laughs> is not specific <laughs> enough, I know, but um, there's ways to remedy that. Um, but, you know, and, and that is another important aspect. But in, in, to dug, dovetail into that, we've just had, um, you know, a report done by um, Scott in relation to our Anti-Discrimination Act, which um, oh, I, there are a lot of recommendations to amend that particular legislation, which is about 30 years old, I think. It was introduced by um, Wayne, Wayne Goss um, when when the Labor Party was uh, re-elected in Queensland all those years ago. Um, um, so there's a lot of moving um, parts in relation to it. And we're also on the verge of um, passing, um, legis well, not passing, but the bill hasn't been introduced yet, but hopefully it will be introduced in relation to serious vilification and hate, hate crimes. And all these pieces of legislation um, go a long way to um, protecting people's rights. Yeah. 
Fantastic work. The Human Rights Law Centre has tracked positive outcomes across all jurisdictions that have a Human Rights Act um, and released a publication setting out 101 case studies of these positive impacts. Caitlin, can you reflect on some of the key factors that are in common across all these um, case studies and perhaps provide a few examples? Yeah, I, I, the research that we've done, and of course this is an ongoing process as, as these, uh, the three jurisdictions that now have uh, Human Rights Acts in place continue to build on that experience. And so some of these positive outcomes uh, are the invisible things as well um, of changing culture and changing um, mindsets and, and practices amongst decision makers. Uh, but we do see that the common elements that are becoming more and more apparent is that as, as Peter mentioned, for, for politicians introducing new legislation, there is you know, increasing practice of having to explain uh, what the human rights impacts are, if there are restrictions needed, how that's been approached. So that transparency in the decision making is a really um, key component. Uh, and, and then looking at the, the, the behaviour and practices of decision makers themselves, uh, ordinary sort of all sorts of areas. But it's really the, the, the outcomes that become most clear is where there's individual, um, individuals have been able to use this as a tool. And, you know, there's, these range from all sorts of situations, from uh, uh, in Queensland, a family violence survivor who managed to use the, the uh, Queensland Act to avoid being evicted and becoming homeless, um, you know, to, you know to, to prevent a situation escalating. Uh, that, that didn't need to. In Victoria, a student with a disability who managed to uh, use the, the Victorian Charter to, to stay in school and keep learning instead of being uh, expelled. Uh, and, uh, you know, so that's, you know, there's really concrete um, examples. And there's the, these kinds of examples that are increasingly occurring as more people start to use the legislation uh, that exists and, uh, and, and builds, builds, on that, um, builds on that practice. And so, yes, you can, you can look at the website and, and find many, many examples. You can search by types of rights. You can search by jurisdiction. And, and this is part of building up this, this, uh, this culture and the practice. I'm going to throw a bonus question for myself. Um, is Australia one of the very few countries at a national level that doesn't have? We are an outlier. We are an that. outlier. We are absolutely. The, we are the only Western liberal democracy that does not have this foundational piece of modern human rights law uh, built into our legal system. Uh, we, we advocate for this. Australia has been a leading voice in, in the development of international human rights law uh, right from the beginning with the, the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, we expect other countries to, to uphold this. We put money into this internationally and it's time for us to, to walk the talk here. Um, and not, uh, not just rely on uh, our, our traditions where we know that there are people falling through the gaps. Thank you. At the national level, there have been specific uh, human rights compatibility processes for the past 10 years uh, introduced in the place of a Human Rights Act. The Commission's position paper also references the need to enhance the federal parliamentary scrutiny processes uh, for a human rights. Uh, Roz, how do you think the existing scrutiny processes could be enhanced? Uh, thanks, Mohammed. Oh, sorry. Thanks, Mohammed. Um, the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights, which is the key mechanism among the scrutiny committees at the federal level that focuses on human rights, I'm a fan of that committee. It has a great place to play and I acknowledge former Attorney General Robert McClellan, now Deputy Chief Justice of the Family Court, for his role in relation to the introduction of that committee. The parliamentary scrutiny is one of the key components of the dialogue model. It's where um, the, through the scrutiny using a human rights lens, there is um, a process of advising, informing legislators about the potential human rights breaches that might be involved in proposed laws. But it's not just 
that element that's crucial. It is the fact that statements of compatibility are required to be provided with each piece of um, of legislation. And that is where you start to get that upstream engagement of the drafters of the bills of the departments that are writing the statements of compatibility for the bill's proponents. It's where you start to get the anchoring of human rights at that upstream level, which is really the essence of all of the proposals we're talking about. The limitations on that committee, and it's had 10 years and it's improved a lot of the way it's, it's, it's been working over the years, there are limitations. One of the key limitations is the fact that it, like the Australian Human Rights Commission, references the international treaties in part of their key processes. They're not scrutinising against domestic law. So the anchor point, the bedrock of rights in Australian law for a scrutiny process is missing. So they're already on an uphill in terms of persuading the legislators in our good parliament to take a human rights lens on the issues when they're not part of domestic law. I mean, there are other elements that, that are advanced in the paper for improving the, the way that that scrutiny process engages the parliament. But I think the, the key thing for me is the, the absence of that bedrock of rights against which that scrutiny is conducted, bedrock of rights as Australian law. Thank you. Terry, you're a member of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal or the AAT for approximately 40 years. How do you think your decision making would have been affected if the Human Rights Act was in place, particularly if there were the proposed positive duties on decision makers and public servants more generally that are proposed in the uh, Commission's Human Rights Act model? Thank you. Um, by a very small amount, and this hints at um, why this piece is so crucially important, uh, and I feel like a pariah until it's eventually enacted uh, whenever I'm in my own country, much less in somebody else's country. Uh, but um, the AAT, the Social Security Appeals Tribunal Level 1, AAT Level 1, um, has been uh, considering human rights treaties from the get-go. Um, in 1991, I handed down two decisions in Underwood and Kumar, as an example, that the, that the depart which were about uh, a special benefit payment to uh, a refugee child, the parents of whom was totally barred from payment. Uh, for, for reasons that will sound familiar to you, the government of the day didn't like it. They rushed it off to... The, uh, the general division of the uh, AAT, and it came before uh, Justice O'Connor. And both in my decision and her decision, uh, the Convention on the Rights of the Child uh, featured prominently uh, in why it was appropriate that that discre discretionary payment uh, was, as I uh, de determined, uh, payable, and more importantly, why it was payable uh, at the high, high rate rather than the low rate for which... Uh, uh, as a default, the, the government uh, was, uh, was wanting to persuade the tribunal to adopt. So, um, yeah, um, it, it would make a, a little bit dif of difference. It would give a little bit more encouragement and amplification of that. But my decisions were not the exception by any means. The, the, the tribunals regularly took, it, took paid regard to TO, High Court, etc., and international obligations. So in relation to rob robo-debt specifically, um, you've indicated to the current Royal Commission that you've made several decisions overturning that, uh, decisions made under that scheme. What do you think would have occurred if there had been a Human Rights Act? I'm afraid nothing would have changed. And, um, you know, if, if uh, senior bureaucrats and men very senior cabinet ministers and others mm. can ignore and game the rule of law, uh, you know, the issue of legality. And by gaming, I mean that unlike those cases I mentioned that the department rushed to AAT uh, the top level to see whether I was right or not, um, in none of the, and it turns out that there were 
um, uh, somewhere in the order of 340 decisions in addition to my five that overturned um, for illegality robo-debts. In none of those cases, um, the gaming was that uh, in none of those cases did the Commonwealth exercise its right to take it uh, to AAT2, the General Division. Why not? Because the hearing would be public and the decisions would have been public. Uh, now, so that's why uh, that wouldn't have changed. One little bit of context that's important that has come out of this um, uh, Royal Commission uh, and the class action that preceded it. We now know how many false and completely illegal decisions there were. 443,000. That's the number from the class action. Only 521 of those cases wended their way through to AAT first tier level. I don't know whether... I, I'm a lawyer because, you know, the math uh, of science, uh, you know, <laughs> tended to trip me up. But that's five in every 10,000 wrong decisions affecting an ordinary citizen and their livelihood. Um, you know, these debts were, were huge, uh, often, uh, ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 of false debt, but only five in every um, uh, 10,000 got through to the lowest level of the tribunal for the secret hearing and secret reasons. So, uh, yes, uh, a Human Rights Act and the provisions that are in it about uh, participation and the substantive right uh, would make uh, a bit of difference. They would strengthen my arm a little, uh, but uh, a government uh, could, uh, as it did for over three and a half years, ignore not just the AAT but the ombudsman, um, all of the checks and balances that uh, were put in uh, place uh, over the last 30 or 40 years were able as I say, to be ignored and gained by government. So that, that gives an indication of the magnitude of the challenge that we have in trying to protect the human rights of ordinary citizens, those almost half a million robo-debt citizens. Incredible. Staying with robo-debt, um, Ros, the proposed Human Rights Act would provide direct causes of action to challenge the operation of the robo-debt scheme. Do you think that this might have provided some additional levers to address the problems with the RoboDirt scheme earlier? Um, I do. Oh, sorry. sorry. I do. And the reason I think it would make a difference is that while Emeritus Professor Carney is an excellent example of someone who not only gets human rights but understands the implications and their impact in relation to decision-making as a tribunal member, without that being the, the obligation on every tribunal member and any judge who ends up being involved in any consideration of the issues, you have the possibility for it just being an obligation that sits on the shoulders of good people like Terry. And it should be the obligation across the board to have that human rights lens as the key interpretative principle in making those decisions. But of course, it's, you know, despite um, what Terry has said, and there was this. I, I feel the pain in your experiences, Terry, absolutely, um, and the frustration um, when, when advice to ministers has been ignored. But the more that you can get that bedrock of understanding and rights-mindedness as this requirement uh, for generation upon generation of public servants and the um, impact through the parliamentary space and having ministers having to stand up and say, yes, I am doing this and I'm okay with it in the federal sphere, it, it shifts that whole dial of accountability. And so that, for me, is where the, the significant impact will lie. Having a cause of action is also necessary to address the fundamental impotence of the system that's been in place since 1981 without the potential of adding a layer of consideration in a court as the last resort. And I emphasise as a last resort, the whole dynamic of 
improved human rights consideration is in the upstream. It's in the area where people act and live and breathe and, and experience human rights and think about human rights. But without having the possibility of a cause of action um, to complement any administrative review, then we are essentially at status quo and with now 40 plus years of experience of engagement in human rights complaints that do not reference an Australian Human Rights Act, we're not going to improve the situation at all. Mm -hmm. So it's about changing culture. Um, and we'll come to uh, a question about culture later on. Um, can I ask you, Ros, about, uh, I mean, you spoke to earlier about, about COVID-19 and the restrictions around travel. Um, how would the Commission's handling complaints of this nature be different under a Human Rights Act? Well, for a start, the um, positive obligation on the public servants to think through a human rights lens, um, you'd hope, would head off even the, 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 the need to make a complaint, that the decisions would be better in the first place. Um, but if there is a decision made notwithstanding thinking through that human rights lens, then there is a pathway, which is a pathway that we have now, but it's a pathway with nowhere to go. So the willingness to engage in a process which has no pathway to go, has no levers that can be pulled, then the effectiveness of the whole process has got some significantly missing components. Our experience of 40 plus years demonstrates the need for that evolution to include the cause of action, to give that leverage to improve the engagement in the first place, hopefully improve the decision so that we have fewer that are coming to the Commission. But um, we were overwhelmed with complaints relating to directly to human rights issues, nothing to do with discrimination laws, well, rather, on top of all of the complaints we deal with about um, discrimination laws. And on average, we deal with 2,000 of those a year, doubled effectively during the, um, the, the COVID situation. And we manage 15,000 inquiries a year on average pre-COVID in helping people on their pathway to, uh, to resolution. But without a human rights cause, a cause of action, then we have this limbo of um, batting around issues with no potential remedy. So it's the absence of effective remedy that is the that provides the structure to much more effective handling of complaints about these really key issues. Yeah, fascinating. Uh, Peter, can you reflect on the role of the Legal Affairs and Community Safety Committee during the COVID-19 pandemic and how it contributed to better decision making because of the Human Rights Act? Um, that's probably a difficult question for me to answer in the sense that a lot of the legislation uh, went to the health committee. Um, but just from my memory of, of how that um, the bills were um, debated in the House and then voted on, um, I, looking through that lens, I, I believe that um, the Human Rights Act um, did uh, contribute to um, um, legislation, although, you know, it was legislation that restricted people's rights. Um, there's no getting away from that. Um, and, you know, the overriding um, argument that was obviously put up um, was that it was for the broader safety of the community. Um, however, I'm fairly certain, someone could correct me, there were no times where the Act had to be uh, overridden. Um, but um, all those pieces of legislation would have had a compatibility uh, component that the committee would have had to look at and also the ministers. Mm. Yeah, fantastic. Caitlin, what role did the Victorian Human Rights Act play in Melbourne, the, the longest um, lockdown city in the world during the pandemic? I mean, times of crisis, whether it's a pandemic or a war or acts of terrorism, they're the times when human rights are most tested mm -hmm. and frequently ignored uh, and most needed, particularly for, for those who are most vulnerable. And remembering that, that, that 
COVID-19 itself posed a threat, poses a threat to people's rights to health and in, in many people's case also um, their rights to life. And so, you know, that, that was the context and what, a, what having a clear human rights legal framework like the Victorian Charter did is it provides a clear set of rules for how the balancing between different types of rights some that are the justification, some that are um, being affected, takes place. That, that's a hard balance for anyone in uh, the enviable task of having to make those calls. And, you know, we, we, did, we did see the, the, the charter in practice when, uh, when after the initial emergency phase, um, but even even during the emergency phase, for instance, the, the um, emergency powers and the introduction of a nighttime curfew, the Victorian government had to explain transparently that there was a recognition of restriction of rights and that, you know, that had to be justified and defined. But then after the emergency phase, there was proposed um, public health legislation that was put forward into Parliament uh, that would have, uh, would have empowered, authorised uh, potentially anybody um, under, under public health legislation to detain people on the basis of what they might do. That's a pretty uh, vague and potentially arbitrary power being given to somebody under a difficult time. And the, the existence of the Charter meant that uh, the Human Rights Law Centre, many other org organisations, the Parliamentary Scrutiny Committee was able to say, no, that's gone too far. This is too broad and goes beyond the, the legitimate aims and the proportional response that needs to be uh, factored in, in in dealing with this crisis. Uh, and particularly because that was forward-looking legislation that was, was for potentially future um, pandemics. And so ultimately that conversation, that scrutiny, that... Uh, uh, clear set of rules to follow meant that the government, you know, adjusted course, took that the, those detention powers out of, out of the, uh, the new legislation. So it, it did work. Excellent. The Commission's model proposes a Human Rights Act that um, includes civil and political rights, as well as key features of economical, uh, social and cultural rights. Ros, can you talk to how the Commission has um, proposed the inclusion of these rights, and how far have you gone on this? The inclusion of economic, cultural and social rights was an absolutely essential part of our proposed model. Um, the inclusion of those rights draws not just from the international covenant, especially on economic, cultural and social rights, but it draws from all of the other treaties that support the Convention on the Rights of the Child, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and uh, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The need to protect economic, cultural and social rights is also a key issue identified in any consultation process, whether it was the national consultation process behind the 2009 report of the Brennan Committee, whether it is the consultations that are done with children, with um, Indigenous peoples, with people with disability, it's the absence of core rights, right to health, right to education, right to a healthy environment and a right to an adequate standard of living, to mention key rights that are always top of people's agendas. So for us to ignore putting those rights into our model, proposed model, would be a failing on behalf of the National Human Rights Institution. But the way that we're proposing acknowledges the, um, that the rights themselves, the, the realisation of those rights sits in large measure outside the language of the Act, but through um, complementing um, some clear language in the Act with the um, accountability through the parliamentary scrutiny processes and, um, and also through an active monitoring of progress, like the closing the gap monitoring in relation to um, in Indigenous health outcomes and, and others, that it's a combination of having clear language 
in a, in a narrower way within the legislation, but also the complementary processes that pick up the key obligation on nation states for progressive realisation, which sit better outside a, um, a court environment. So it, it, it's a calibration of what is constitutionally sound and invoking that dialogue process with the other key actors in the um, in the model. But if we had nothing about economic, cultural and social rights, we would be continuing the manifestation of a huge gap in our rights protection. Thank you. Caitlin, the Human Rights Law Centre also advocated for uh, these uh, rights. Are you a fan of the, the proposed model and what do you think of the coverage? I think it's a really important step forward to, to effectively not make a distinction between categories of rights. And so I, I absolutely commend the, the Commission's approach um, in that regard. The, the distinction between civil and political rights and economic, social and cultural rights is a relic of the Cold War political time in which the, the foundational treaties were drafted. It doesn't really have a place in modern human rights law frameworks. You know, last year the UN Secretary General came out and restated very clearly again the, the basic uh, principle about the indivisibility of human rights and the universality of them. And we also know that from the research we've done at, at the Human Rights Law Centre, including a major survey in 2019, that this is also what speaks most clearly to community values, that, that we... Um, as a society, uh, really value the, the right to housing, the right to education, the right to health, as much as we do our political participation rights and um, our other sort of classic civil and political rights. And so that, that distinction really just doesn't, it, it doesn't really have uh, a meaning. It's not in step with, uh, with community expectations. And so, yeah, I think that the way the, the Commission's put this forward, building on the work that's been done in the, the three state and territory jurisdictions so far is a, is a really important step forward. Yeah, great. Peter, the Queensland Human Rights Act went further than the Victorian um, Act um, in, in, uh, for, these, uh, for these rights. What's been your experience under the Queensland Act? Um, well, just going back to the number of matters that um, go to the Human Rights Commission, I think um, there are a broad range of uh, matters that have uh, taken there uh, uh, seeking resolution from, as I said earlier, from interaction with um, the police to uh, your rights if you're um, incarcerated to uh, issues with with health and, and education. So, you know, I, I think um, that, to my mind, encapsulates um, how um, our act in Queensland is, is uh, working. And I think some of the dialogue that I've read um, would indicate that most people and most of the departments are viewing what's the process that is happening as a positive rather than a negative. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, one of the innovative features of the Federal Human Rights Act model proposed by the Commission is the inclusion of two new specific duties on officials. The first being to ensure participation of, in decision making of Indigenous peoples persons with disability and children. And the second one is a duty to ensure equal access to justice. Ros, can you talk to the rationale of these duties? First, why a participation duty? It was important to call it a duty rather than just um, a sense of an obligation to consult. It has to be given that really hard expectation that in areas of key decision making that the people most affected must be consulted. So the duty element gives that its sharp edge. And the, the three identified communities have all got in the treaties that sit behind them, the international instruments that sit behind them, clear obligations of engagement, active engagement and participation of those communities. Um, the, um, the way that that will be given effect to as well is by ensuring that any scrutiny 
of proposed um, legislation has as part of it an accountability to the parliamentary forum in terms of what processes of participation were conducted in reaching the, um, the, the legislation or legislative instrument that's being propounded. So calling it a duty was part of that conceptualising of what this looks like. It's not merely a, um, um, an obligation to consult. It's an obligation to involve in a participatory way in the key areas of decision making and legislation that affect those key communities. So how do you see this uh, interacting with the voice to parliament referendum? Um, it complements um, that uh, proposal. If um, and when a, a, the, the voice mechanism is enshrined and developed, then it will provide a vehicle through which that participation duty could be fulfilled. But it's not for me to say how that would work. Part of the design of the mechanism itself would be um, the, the process of engagement with, with parliamentary processes. But it's, it would complement absolutely um, the, the, the idea of the duty that we've proposed. And can you also explain to us the equal access to justice duty? The idea for this is to distill and elevate from both common law and, and other areas of statute where there are certain obligations in relation to providing access to justice. But equal access to justice requires certain things to be fundamental in the way that particularly our, our court system and more broadly our um, tribunal and court systems work. Um, the uh, provision of proper physical access, the provision of proper interpretative access. There are so many elements in the um, access to justice that requires a focus on what amounts to equal access to justice. There is also room for the um, um, distillation of the key elements of things like the principle of legality and, and other areas of obligation that are percolating through common law and other places, but to put it firmly within the idea of a human rights framework as a duty um, elevates it to a, a level that is just missing in the fragmented approach we have to such matters. Mm. Terry, this second duty of equal access to justice is intended to supplement and give greater um, emphasis to requirements for procedural fairness. Can you reflect on how this might operate in the context of uh, administrative law review? Yes, um, again, for the constituencies that I've already identified, uh, not a lot. Um, both are very important, but of the two participation, uh, the duty to participate in making policy and developing administrative processes is the key one. Uh, for non-lawyers, it's called the principle of co-design. And we wouldn't have had robo-debt and we won't repeat robo-debt if people understand uh, and honour uh, the notion that uh, programs are developed with the people affected and their genuine participation in it. Uh, the reason that the um, equal access one won't make any difference is that, uh, you know, there are 10 to 12,000 um, uh, cases going to the AAT in Social Security uh, alone, um, even though that is, um, we now know, as I say, uh, five in every 10,000 matters that, uh, you know, uh, that could be the subject of a complaint. Um, and uh, because of that, on the face of it, big volume, uh, you get an hour or so to um, conduct a hearing and it is, it, it is and should be inquisitorial. Uh, and, all, you know, from the very outset of the AAT's jurisdiction in these areas, uh, every member has had the obligation to uh, ensure that there's uh, equal hearing of uh, the uh, citizens' uh, concern, turning your mind to the incompetent government that hasn't explained the ever, the basis on which it's made its decision and thinking about uh, ensuring that procedural fairness is done to them uh, and uh, deciding what is the correct and preferable uh, decision, all in that 
uh, inquisitorial hour or so um, of your uh, hearing. So um, that's why there's not going to be much change there. And finally, um, one of the, I think, areas that this paper um, can and should work up on is, I see, you see, in my, in my area, we're not really talking about public servants in the main making decisions anymore. We're talking about uh, people in job agencies. They're, they're in, in a private market. Mm. Now, OK, this paper catches them as a functional public authority. But private citizens working in business environments uh, cannot, do not grasp the basics of anything to do with public service administration, and they won't grasp uh, and honour human rights either. So in the neoliberal state, where everything is outsourced for decision making, uh, ensuring that these two rights to participation and to uh, equal access to justice uh, are honoured, it, it's a big challenge. Um, the, the paper sets the goal um, correctly, but you know, reading page 18 of uh, the summary and the main report, it's just a goal and it won't be realised at all on the current uh, machinery that is being proposed. New machinery has to be, uh, uh, as part of the revamping of the AAT, or as the, a former ombudsman said today, the power that he used twice as an ombudsman to refer a, for opinion a matter to a court or tribunal, something that you know, our judicial training says it has to be a real matter. We, we don't put hypotheticals to people. Well, the Ombudsman Act already has that power, and uh, the Ombudsman, the Commonwealth Ombudsman, has exercised it twice. So uh, you can have creative thinking about how you ensure that very worthy goals are actually realised in a way that I'm afraid on this one, at the moment, I fear it'll just be paid lip service to. I'm sorry, I spoke too long, but got a lot of things off my chest. <laughs> Thank you. That's fantastic. Um, so one of the key features of this proposal um, is to try and build a, a, a cult, uh, create a cultural change um, and focus the human rights, res, you know, res, put respect back into human rights. Ros, can you talk to what change you're trying to achieve and what do you hope to, you know, leave, especially in our parliament? Uh, well, in part... In answering that, I want to pick up on something that, that Terry said, and that's the functional public authorities and how you make these um, private citizens, I think you described them, yeah. um, understand better. Well, part of that, I think, is addressed in how you set the tenders. You know, they're not going to get hired to do this functional public authority work unless they can demonstrate certain things in, in their processes. You've got the big leverage of the contracting, of government contracting, to try and work that. So um, I have more, I'm uh, more optimistic about the possibilities of that contracting leverage and the uh, accounting um, for the actions. Um, so it's both the, the front ending in terms of do you get the contract or not, but it's also the accountability for how you discharge those contracts, which will ensure or go to whether you keep your contract or not. So I, I think there are ways to advance it. Um, in terms of the cultural change, I, I do have faith there <laughs> that the um, it'll take a while, but, um, you know, I've seen many generations of law students who, who want to understand the way that human rights work, um, that pursue it as, um, as part of their own development of their own rights-minded psyche as they mature, and I would hope that, that they and the generations of young public servants I have had the great privilege to engage with in my role, both in law reform and now at the Human Rights Commission, the, f the, the future for me 
is very much in how they respond and their enlightened leaders who want to embrace it as well um, can shift that whole sense. that it, So it becomes part of the national psyche of decision-making. This is a long-haul project. Law reform is, uh, is something with a long horizon, but unless you have that horizon and the faith in the people that can get there, um, you know, you're missing from my personal agenda. Amazing. Thank you. Um, we'll come to questions in a second, so um, if you haven't thought of your question, please uh, do so. Um, but I'll just come to, uh, to Peter and um, Caitlin and Terry, just quickly from your reflection on um, how the Queensland, Victorian and um, the ACT, how, how's, how has the Human Rights Act made a difference to the culture um, in that state? Um. I mean, I think um, from where I sit, sometimes it's difficult to to gauge what's happening in, in the in the wider community when you come to culture. But um, I guess, from my point of view, the fact that there is a discussion about it, it is a cultural move. Um, without that piece of legislation, I'm sure there are a lot of um, discussions and, uh, and a lot of matters that wouldn't have been, uh, people wouldn't have had the courage to come forward and go to um, the Human Rights, Queensland Human Rights Commission to uh, have their grievances aired. So uh, to me, that's the cultural shift. How far it's that cultural shift that has happened in Queensland, um, I, I'm not, you know, I wouldn't be able to to monitor that or, or, or make a, you know, uh, an informed comment. Time will tell. Time will tell. Caitlin? Yeah, I think that culture change really, um, you know, is, is obviously a long-term process, but it's also not the domain of lawyers. We might like to think that, you know, we define things and everybody should listen, but as, as Terry mentioned, I mean, there's limits to what uh, a law is actually going to do, but our laws should also be reflective of where our culture has got to. The value of, of a law like the Victorian Charter or like what's being proposed here for a, for a federal commission, a, a federal char charter of um, human rights, is that it provides a common set of language and a common set of definitions that is, you know, it's a dynamic process of of embedding that into our culture. It, it gives a framework to be teaching school kids around, you know, what human rights means and not just referencing that to a document drafted, you know, in 1948, but something that is embedded here um, that reflects uh, the needs and, and aspirations of, um, of, of you know, Australians today. And, it, you know, the best work in many ways of, uh, of something like the Victorian Charter is when we don't hear about it because it's actually being embedded into better decision making every day. You know, that, that's using the law is something that you should have access to as a last resort, but that should be the exception, not the, the norm. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the, you know, there were fears when the Victorian Charter came in that there would be this flood of litigation and in fact, that hasn't been the case, but that's not necessary. That's I don't see that as a failure as well. I mean, it's there; it should be used. Uh, it needs to be used to be brought to life. But it's also about uh, you know the examples we've we've talked about uh, in terms of that 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 transparency of, of articulating how decisions are made uh, and providing the backup when it's needed. Yeah. Terry, do you think the Robert Dett Royal Commission and the hearing that we you know, we're listening to every day. Do you, do you see that as a catalyst for that cultural change? And in terms of timing for a National Human Rights Act, is this the right time? Uh, yes, I think it is the right time. And I'm a thousand percent behind all of the proposals in this document. Don't misunderstand me. Um, and it'll be a big catalyst for change, that Royal Commission, because it understands how... Um, public administration at the federal and state level has been completely hollowed out. Public servants no longer administer serve any service mm. to any Australian citizen outside a few help, perhaps mental health uh, hospital care and a few uh, other areas. Uh, if you don't believe me, pick up that splendid book by Mark Considine from Melbourne, uh, The Careless State, that explains why contracting and levers of tendering and all these other mechanisms that 
uh, we, we need to have in place, don't misunderstand me, have totally failed for, as the Aged Care Royal Commission found, for 20 or 30 years. And it's because it, you're left with Buckley's choice as a, as a government administrator in letting the tender. Um, yes, they're not honouring the requirements of the tender brief. What are you going to do? Are you going to close all the aged care uh, facilities by those providers or in the NDIS or any of the other areas that um, there's a, it's a short book, <laughs> there are ten chapters and, you know, <laughs> I've mentioned three of them. And, and so the challenge for this uh, final report, really, is to turn this really excellent set of uh, machinery and recommendations in areas like um, how you deal with the private sector uh, and the neoliberal uh, um, contracting out of things uh, in, in, into great uh, workable uh, recommendations. And I'm satisfied that the RoboDebt Royal Commission actually has got that. But it'll be only one example, I mean a small social security example, it leaves the other nine areas like aged care and NDIS and um, occupational health and safety, uh, transport accident commissions. Uh, you know, you can just go on and on. Um, the, the challenge is huge. I think all public servants are on notice um, following <laughs> yes. that Royal Commission. Um, thank you, everybody, for uh, that fascinating discussion. We'll go to a few questions from our live audience. If you have a question, please put your hand up. This is your time to shine. We'd love uh, some really difficult questions. We've got a question over there. Please keep it to a question, if possible. It'll be a question, all right. Uh, on John McCarthy KC, I'm the chair of the Anti-Slavery Task Force of the Catholic Church. My question is to each of the panellists to give an answer. How about we, for a moment, deal with the real political problem that is faced in relation to human rights. I've been through the documentation uh, and uh, as always with anything associated with Professor Croucher, uh, it's brilliantly presented. But one section that is not there is dealing with the Brennan Royal Commission. Uh, the originator of the Brennan uh, inquiry into uh, uh, human rights, uh, Robert McClelland, is here tonight. The important material that they found was that the Australian public was at about 11% in relation to seeing this, these issues as a problem. As a, as a social and political problem. And that that was known fairly quickly to the Cabinet and the Parliament in Australia. And it has continued in that way as being a situation where the great bulk of our citizens believe they live in a fairly just society that they believe that they are reasonably looked after and they don't believe that they need these sorts of laws. At least this, that's, what's, uh, that's what seems to be thrown up. Uh, I have to say that uh, it's something I would prefer was otherwise, but that's seems to be the picture of Australia, of, of, of Australians. On top of that, we have this, that most of the items that we have here today, if you have them subject to a pub test, are not likely to succeed, it seems to me. Secondly, we live with a situation where most of the world admires our country admires, and I say that as having represented Australia as an ambassador overseas, uh, that uh, uh, we are seen 
as one of the better parts of humanity around the place. And a fair bit of that has seeped into our own people. That seems to me to be at least some of the frameworks, Professor Croucher, for what are the real political problems that face any human rights act going forward. And uh, I, uh, I was going to invite each of the panellists to tell me how they think Australia is at the present time. Thank you. I'm happy to take that on, Please. John. Always good to see you. The situation in 2009, we build on the shoulders of giants, as I said, and the consultation in the Brennan Report was a, a very wide sweeping consultation in 2009. Since 2009, there have been a number of very serious royal commissions. A royal commission in, into institutional child abuse, the uh, current royal commission in relation to people with disability, and of course the royal commission into robodeck. That's just three to mention a few. To, to say that there are not great gulfs in human rights protection is exposed, I would say, by the findings and the evidence given in each of those Royal Commissions and indeed in our experience during COVID where notwithstanding the, the real sense of rights and freedoms that we do share as proud Australians, notwithstanding that, we have a continued incarceration rate of our First Peoples at a horrifying rate. We have so many other examples where our faith and our confidence in the rights and freedoms that you refer to is not all right. So I think the pub test question that you pose might be answered very differently now in 2023 than it was answered in 2009 in light of every one of those serious exposures of failings of human rights for some of our most vulnerable people, our children, our First Nations and people with disability. Thank you. Um, is there another question somewhere? Live audience, no? Um, there are a couple of uh, questions. One there. Uh, one okay, there. we'll go one question over there and then we'll go for a couple of questions uh, from our online audience. Thank you very much for the presentation. I'm Sevita Clark, lecturer of law at the Australian Catholic University, uh, specialising in human rights law. And I, and I understand from the history of attempts to incorporate human rights into Commonwealth legislation has been a constitutional barrier. And we've heard from you, panellists, and I thank you very much for enlightening the Australian community in the sense that there's this idea that actually human rights aren't reflected in our values. In fact, as Caitlin, you pointed out, this federal act would reinforce the values already held by many Australians, as the Britain Inquiry showed and continues to show through the Royal Commissions. How then can we say, or do you see a challenge from the states when in fact the states and the territories are on the march with human rights acts and we want a consistent human rights language? When do you think there are any challenges to the Commonwealth who's actually the bearer of international legal obligations taking the lead? Thank you. Can I answer this quickly yes. and then I'll hand it over. The, the Commonwealth and states have different responsibilities. We are exposed as a nation in our failing to have a national human rights protection, but the states are also party, uh, a part of that obligation. But if we do not have the protection at the federal level in relation to the specific areas of federal competence, and they cover a vast array of legislation that, do, that does affect our most vulnerable people, all the good work that is done at state and territories which have Human Rights Act, which can engage in their legislation, we're left bereft of coverage if we don't have the joining of the dots across the nation, and particularly with the, 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 at the federal level, and it's the federal parliament that has, or the government at the federal level, and I should say of both persuasions of politics, broadly um, cast, that have signed us up and promised to the world that we will do these things. So the absence at the federal level exposes us in terms of that coverage. Thank you. 
Peter, did no, you want to say? No, I don't have anything to add. Go for it. Uh, just one thing in relation to that question and John's question. Um, I applaud and I think the states will follow the inclusion of socioeconomic uh, rights for the reasons mentioned. Socioeconomic rights, on the other hand, expose John's issue to a perhaps greater extent than do civil and political rights in that it's difficult to define what the standard is going to be. And um, even the world community, to take the right to health that I've written about, I've also written about the right to social security, but to take that one, it, it, it's of the socioeconomic rights, it's the right to health that most countries and the international community have mainly focused on. And I think the, uh, a significant part of the answer to John's concern and my issue about a building further in the final report is to look at, for example, what the international community has done, and that is to look for indicators. They don't look so much for um, you know, actions in tribunals or uh, courts or uh, parliamentary committees. Uh, they lay down uh, a bit like the closing the gap um, um, uh, standards and goals, uh, things that no human could object to. And, you know, to take Social Security, arguably it is that uh, whatever the rate is, it should never leave people below the Australian-defined poverty line as currently all unemployed people on the unemployment payment are. Uh, so I think thinking about what the, what the concrete, um, I'd say almost common sense sort of additional machinery is that, that, that helps to realise these more abstract general rights that we've been discussing today, um, that's, that's, the, that's the piece of work that I think, uh, I'm sure the Commission will uh, pursue, and I think that as a community uh, we need to continue to pursue. Because otherwise, you're dead right, John, um, that uh, either the uh, Act won't be um, pursued by either side of government, or if it is, uh, it won't have anything like the impact in this room we all wanted to have. You know, Brennan was right in, in, in looking at uh, the pub test and, uh, and the politics. Um, and if I can just add to that, Terry, you're absolutely right. The, the need for indicators and tracking is the essence of making a, an effective mm. human rights framework and that's the next part of the work and I'd love to keep talking to you about that because your wisdom and experience over your many years, is it precisely the kind of guidance and input that we draw from all of you and all of you who have been involved in our processes so far. So I agree entirely and that's our next bit of work. And I would just add that it's including on this question of how you actually measure and, and track the, these kinds of things, Australia's standing has slipped. And that's from the Global Press Freedom Index, that's from the Rights Tracker uh, initiative that's measuring human rights um, progress, you know, in, I think it's, it's, you know, into the dozens of countries that they're now systematically measuring this. And we've got many adverse findings now against Australia from different international human rights bodies, most recently in our uh, compliance with our voluntary obligations that we undertook in terms of the, the torture convention and the optional protocol. Mm. So our standing has slipped mm. and we are behind even co comparable countries, um, so, you know, whether it's Canada or New Zealand or the UK. Uh, and, you know, we can't, I think, rest on our laurels. And if anything the experience of the last three years has reminded everybody about the, the, the very um, real and live differences between, you know, what postcode you live in and which state and territory you live in, in terms of what your protections are. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that, that's a very, you know, live reminder that, you know, our human rights shouldn't be dependent, our, our level of protection of human rights and, and what we can do to um, enforce them when we need to shouldn't depend on where we live or what our bank balance is. Mm. There's a question uh, from an online um, uh, audience from Danny, and this is an issue um, I'm passionate about and is close to my heart, and that's around if we had a nationwide, uh, nationwide uh, Human Rights Act, how will it um, affect our offshore detention um, centres and how we treat refugees and people seeking asylum 
Maybe Roz, you want to take that? <laughs> this is where we do hit up against certain limitations on what we can achieve. But if what we're talking about is the formulation of policy that has, it, that has a reach in terms of offshore detention and other mechanisms, then the accountability for the development of those policies is where you might get the, the real traction in terms of um, uh, human rights compliant initiatives. So it shifts the whole lens upstream. That's where we're likely to get the traction. And if, if there are decisions about what is lawful and what is not unlawful, the fact that we've included an interpretive obligation that brings in the understanding of the, um, the human rights world, the, um, the, the, the treaty obligations, the, the act that we're proposing, and also interpretative um, comments that are made over the years. So it's an ongoing dialogue of consideration. So um, within whatever constitutional constraints, the impact on the upstream and policy making is where I would place the hope for change. Caitlin, specifically around indefinite detention, what do you think? Well, this is one of the examples where we have repeatedly been called out internationally for failing to meet international human rights obligations. Um, and so, you know, I, I, if you look at the, the model that's been proposed in, in the paper, it does expand the coverage to uh, not only to government contractors, but, um, but where we are exercising effective control, I think, is the language used. And so I, I, you know, I think this, you know, the, the hope is that this should be something that would actually start to change the, the calculus as well and make that calculus explicit when, when there are times where it gets restricted, um, you know, in terms of, um, you know, rights, but particularly the most fundamental one around when, this, when the state gets to take people's liberty away. There's a question from um, Hannah and... She asks, does the position paper recommend the inclusion of a right to a safe and healthy environment in the proposed Human Rights Act? Yes. <laughs> That's a question I like. <laughs> um, I'll take one last question. I'm just checking time. How are we tracking? One more and then, okay. Um, I'll go there and then there's one more online question. Hi, I'm Christopher Macquarie University. Um, basically, the big question is the National Human Rights Institution has not tabled a position paper. What are the next steps? What will be the next task for the Australian Human Rights Commission to move this forward, advocate? Where are we with the politicians, Caitlin, the Human Rights Law Centre? How does this change your calculus and the next tasks for moving this agenda forward at the federal level? And where are we in the judiciary? What kind of work needs to be done to basically, as an agenda for a society, to move this forward? Huge question. Um, there's a lot. Um, the report that we're um, preparing over the rest of this year will crystallise the, the Human Rights Framework Initiative and the indicators, the tracking that, that um, Terry was talking about. Um, and because we will do that as a report and it will draw in the discrimination law work we've done and the Human Rights Act paper, it will force it into the parliamentary arena because it, has, it will have to be tabled by the minister. Mm -hmm. And once it's tabled by the minister, and I know that this minister is very interested in our work, he has read it all, he read the discrimination law paper when he was the shadow attorney. We had very lively conversations about it. He is engaged. Now, for a start, having a minister who is engaged and, and seeing the, the reform agenda that this attorney has on the horizon, this conversation that we're having tonight and the work that we and others have been doing clearly speaks to the law reform agenda of this attorney. Thank you. There's a question from... Uh Dashanik from um, uh, online, um, and they're asking, a Human Rights Act means governments can in the future amend or repeal the Act. Do you think this is sufficient or does, do, do we need a constitutional amendment here? Oh, Peter or Ross or anybody? For, that's one for you, Ross. Um, <laughs> 
I prefer the model that we are doing as a legislative one. Once you introduce it as legislation, yes, it can be amended, mm. but ta- it will take a lot of political courage and will to amend an act like this once it's in place, amend and improve. But once something is proposed as constitutional, number one, it can involve uh, judicial consideration much more, and I don't want to get anywhere near the model that's in the US. Um, What we have seen in terms of that model is a real politicisation of appointments to the High Court, the equivalent of the High Court bench. I don't want to go anywhere near that kind of model. So while it sits as a, as a legislative model, it still places the, the supremacy in the model with Parliament, but it's been proven as an effective model in other places. That is the model that I think has the most um, weight behind it. It's been a fascinating discussion, but before we, we oh, go um, there, you... Just going to add, I mean, we've had nearly 20 years of the Charter in Victoria. It's, you know, it's been reviewed twice. Uh, some may have hoped that it would be, you know, that that would be a, a way to wind it back. It hasn't. Even in the UK, um, despite Brexit, etc., the Human Rights Act is still standing. And so once these things become part of the furniture, part of the architecture uh, and, and embedding into the sort of the, the cultural landscape, uh, it, it, there's, there's not, a, not a clear case to remove them. So it might not be the perfect level of entrenching, but it's still a pretty good step. Final observation, 10 seconds or less. Rose? Bring rights home. Bring rights home. Thank you. Peter? Oh, I just think it's been a very worthwhile discussion and I think um, everyone's heading in the right direction. Congratulations to the Commission, because I think kicking off this conversation, taking it forward is exactly what we need to do. You can sign up for the Charter Campaign with, along with the other 80 organisations that are already on board. Uh, there's lots of ways that we can keep this conversation going. Fantastic. Yeah, uh, for me, a brilliant start. Um, virtually everything that we need to have is on the table and more power to uh, Rod and the Commission's arm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you all for your questions and thank you to our panellists for that wonderful and fascinating discussion. And uh, for me, thank you for um, starting something that our future generations will see the benefits of. So thank you. Um, our apologies that we, if we didn't have time to answer all the questions. Um, if you'd like to know more about the Commission's um, Human Rights Act position paper, you'll find a copy on their website. And I think a link will be emailed to everybody tomorrow. Um, that's all we have time for today. Um, I'm just trying to kind of see, make sure that I haven't missed anything. Um, please don't forget to tune in again later in the year uh, for the final part of the Free and Equal project when the Commission will draw everything together and lay out um, a vision for delivering a human rights framework for t- 21st century Australia. I'd like to thank uh, once again Gilbert and Tobin for hosting us here today and to our Auslan interpreters uh, Bettina and Rebecca. Thank you very much for that wonderful job. Um, we'll leave you now with uh, one last video from um, the Human Rights Law Centre that was produced as part of their um, Charter, for, uh, Charter of Rights campaign. Um, it focuses on how Victoria's Human Rights Charter has helped protect the rights of First Nations people uh, detained in prisons. Enjoy. I'd like to read a letter from a young person who was one of those uh, who was imprisoned in Bowen. I know I've stuffed up. I've done things I'm not proud of. And so I've spent time locked up. I don't know why it was me that got sent to Bowen. It is an adult prison. For me, Bowen was the worst place I have ever seen. There was no hope for the future. It was just surviving each day. It, it was 
critical that we took action here. Uh, we spoke with the Victorian Aboriginal Legal Service. We're particularly concerned about Aboriginal children. And children as young as 15 being transferred from an age-appropriate youth justice facility to uh, extremely harsh, oppressive conditions, unsafe for children in a maximum security adult jail. We had seen governments do this in Western Australia, transferring kids to a, a, an adult jail. We'd seen it uh, with the horrors of Dondale, with the Northern Territory government transferring children to an adult jail. Legal challenges against those actions failed in Victoria. They succeeded and they succeeded because of the Charter of Human Rights. A litigation guardian is someone who is appointed um, by the court uh, to represent um, people who cannot represent themselves. When I was asked uh, to be a litigation guardian for um, young people uh, who were, who'd been put in an adult prison, uh, that was a new situation for me, but I know the importance of uh, helping young people um, make mistakes and then get over them and learn from them and start again. I mean, that's part of, that's part of growing up. The Charter of Human Rights was absolutely critical in providing uh, power for people to take action to um, uh, protect their human rights. And the evidence uh, we were seeing and hearing was of really inhumane conditions completely inappropriate for children. Children being um, in solitary confinement 23 hours a day, handcuffed when they were leaving their cells. Uh, there were allegations of uh, assaults from guards. Uh, one child was hospitalised, at least one child was hospitalised. Uh, capsicum spray was used in a closed environment there. Children who were supposed to be accessing rehabilitation service and education in particular uh, were not receiving those proper, proper services. And so the Charter of Human Rights guarantees the right to humane treatment in, uh, when, when someone's detained, when they're locked up, and it guarantees uh, the protection of the best interests of children. And so um, based on those two uh, human rights and based on other legal arguments, uh, we worked with the Victorian Aboriginal Legal Service and other partners and pro bono lawyers to bring uh, cases in the Supreme Court challenging the government's actions. When I heard that the case had been won, uh, I was delighted. Each one of these cases that we win means that a more decent society uh, is possible. Charters of human rights, what they do is they embed shared values of equality, freedom, respect, dignity and compassion at the heart of government decision making. So they have to think human rights before they act. That's where charters play their critical role. They prevent human rights abuses from happening in the first place. And if governments still do violate human rights, they give people the power to take action to protect their human rights.